That's right. So here, here's what I'll do. I'll start, I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about me. Uh, my name is Earl Sewell. I'm from Chicago. Um, one of the things I like to tell people is that I'm from a very, very large family. And, uh, and you know, how large? My father is the last child of 18 children. So my grandparents had 18 children together. And so one of the things about that, when I, when I tell that story, people are like, you know, wow, you know, your poor grandmother. <laughs> you know? and, so, uh, and so, you know, the, the family is so big that, you know, whenever there's a gathering, there's always some kind of conflict or problem. Or, you know, you know there's always some story that's getting rehashed and retold. And, you know, it's, it's like I have family members that'll start a story and they'll go back. You remember back in, and there's never a, a, a definite year, 1951, 52, 53, 54, somewhere in that, somewhere in that decade, they'll, they'll, they'll start going there. Um, so out of the 18 children, there are only two left. And one is uh, my father and my uh, aunt. And so one of the things that I have decided to do at this stage in my career is I've decided to go back to school and work on a master's of fine arts degree. And so uh, in doing so, since I'm already published, the university said that, well, you can't come into the university and have your thesis be something that you've already written or published or anything like that. You have to do something completely different. So one of the things I said I'd do, I said I'll do historical fiction. And this is, this is where you talk about, this is where the passion comes in, where you're doing something because you want to do it. And so, I said I'll do historical fiction because it was like this story about family history has just like been calling me for years to write it, but I've just ignored it, I've ignored it, I didn't want to do it, I didn't want to do the research, but something, you know, right here in the gut just said, you need to tell this, you need to tell this. And so one day I was in the middle of producing one of my young adult books and my aunt calls me, and my aunt's 81. And so my aunt still has a southern dialect where she doesn't put all the letters in the words when she talks. And so my name is Earl, my father is Big Earl, so she calls me Lil Earl, not Little Earl, Lil Earl. That's two L's. <laughs> and so she calls me up one day, she says, Lil Earl, and I said, I say, yeah, auntie. She goes, I want you to come by because I want to tell you the family history. And I said, I said, auntie, I ain't got, she goes, nah, you're the writer. I want to come tell you the family history. And I said, so, you know, how do you tell your 81-year-old aunt that, you know, you're not going to come by? You know, as busy as I was, I said, okay, okay, I'll do this. I'll come by your house. So I, I went over to her house, and I sat at her kitchen table, and she, and she said, and she goes, okay, here it is. It's been on my heart for years, and Mama told me that I need to tell it, so I'm going to just tell it like it is. And so I was like, okay. So I got my little recorder and I started recording. She goes, uh-uh, don't point that camera at me. <laughs> and so I started listening to her, you know, tell, you know, tell me names and incidents of things that happened. And one of the things in the family history that I never knew was that they knew the men who killed Emmett Till. And said so, so they were always, they, they got always, they were always harassed by those men. And I was like, I was like, oh, you, you never, no one ever said, she goes, because we don't talk about that. You leave that alone, but she goes, I'm getting old and I gotta get this stuff off my chest. And so I was, like, I was like, okay. So what she ended up doing, she gave me a lot of interesting information. So she gave me a lot of names to, you know, to, to write down and stuff like that. So there's something, uh, there's an adult version of Facebook called Ancestry.com. Anybody ever been on Ancestry.com? Okay, Ancestry.com, if you haven't tried it to look up your family history, it's an amazing place. So I went on Ancestry.com and I started, uh, I, started, I started looking up uh, the family history with the names that I got. And I was absolutely amazed at how far back I was able to get. I was able to, I was able to get my grandfather's World War I draft card. I was, able, I was able to find out names of other people and family members that uh, I did not know. I was able to find birth dates and all this other stuff. And so, and it was even interesting because Ancestry allows you to do an ethnicity DNA test. So I went and did the ethnicity DNA test, come to find out I was part Viking. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, nobody ever told that story. <laughs> and so, and so, and so I was, I'm, like, I'm like, wow, part Viking. I was like, you know, there's the West African and there's the Viking. And so I followed the line back 
on the European side, I was able to get back to the 1500s. I was able to get back to the 1500s, which is like, I'm like, wow. And come to find out the European line that I followed was related to William Shakespeare. And I was like, okay, okay, that's interesting. So from the African-American side, I was able to get back following my grandmother's, uh, my paternal grandmother, I was able to get back to 1815. And so this was, this was like this strange connection to these people that I didn't know. Because in my mind, that's, that's my DNA. That's the history of my DNA. Those are the chapters that preceded me where I am today. So in other words, those individuals had to live and survive and have stories of their own in order for me to live and survive and tell a story. So there was this really strange connection to this. And so when I, when I started my thesis at the program, that was the story that I wanted to write. That was a story, and so it has been an obsession. It has been an obsession. So I start the story in 1918 during the great flu pandemic or the Spanish flu that was happening at the time. And then I found out who the family members were that passed away in, the, uh, in that, in that uh, epidemic and who had to take care of who and all this other stuff. So it's become this really, really interesting, interesting thing. And it's not just the uh, surface writing of like, oh, okay, I know who this is, I know who that is. It's all of the social and emotional and political stuff that happened that shaped these people and shaped the decisions that they made that I find fascinating. And the decisions that they made and how it impacted everyone else's lives. And so that's when you, when you talk about what do you want to write when you just sit down and you just go. It's like, it's like this channeling of these people that, you know, that I don't know because, because of them, I carry their DNA. I carry, I carry them with me. And so when I say that, what I mean by that is, for example, you have a mother and you have a father. You get your hair from your mother, you may get your eyes from your father. You get physical manifestations or physical attributes from your parents or your grandparents, or you may look like an uncle or aunt or something like that. You get physical attributes. So we know that we can actually, you know, that's a tangible thing. So what I say to that, if we can get physical DNA transferred, what about other kinds of spiritual DNA? Habits, thinking, and those kinds of things. You know, thought processes and patterns. You know, those are things that get transferred that you may not know about unless someone tells you, you know who else used to act like this? Your grandmother used to do this. For, for instance, I, I, you know, I've never been a farmer, never been a farmer, you know, never knew nothing about farming. But you know, in my family history, there's nothing but farming. So ironically, when I, bought my, when I purchased my first house, why do I go and buy an historical farmhouse? You know, that was, that was a really weird thing to think about. And so, and so when my 81-year-old aunt came over to my house one day, she says, you know what, Daddy? She's talking about her father. She goes, you know, Daddy, you know, he hated the, he hated the, the house, the, the, the shack that he had. He said, but do you know what he went and did? He got up on some money and he went and bought some house painting and painted it that same color. I was like, really, the color of my house? And I was like, okay, that's just kind of weird for me. But it's little things like that. It's little things like that that you, that you don't know. But when I write, when, as I'm writing this story for my master's program, that's what's drawing me. That's the, that's the thing that's pulling at my soul. So you, you, know, you have a tendency, you know, I'm, I'm learning how to write from that space. When I first started my career in writing, I was writing from that space. But what eventually ends up happening what eventually ends up happening to authors, and you see this with like a J.K. Rollins and all these other people, you, you, when you get to a publisher, and this is where you wanna make money and put food on the table and, you know, and enjoy success, what publishers like to do is they like to find the commercial fiction level. They want you up here. They want you to find what's going to appeal to the masses. What will appeal to the masses, and you know, how can we make money at this? because we want to find a common denominator that everyone can identify with, and you don't necessarily have to delve very deeply into what you're writing. If you look at reality TV shows now, they find the lowest common denominator, and then they put people on screen and say, let them go for it, and you get the masses of people watching the train wreck. But you know, you don't go, you don't go below that. So, so, the, your, so my commercial life, it's like, uh, fiction that's produced just, just to, for escapism and to entertain people. Just, okay, I just wanna, you know, I don't wanna think about my life, I wanna think about somebody else's life and their tragedy, and so that's where I'll 
it's been my focus on and I'll read that and I'll call escape and I'll like it and then I get to talk about those people like they're really real and they're, <laughs> they're really not real but you know then I'll go get a girlfriend or two and we'll talk about you know this book and how these characters weren't real and you know you get this whole thing um, and so you know that's what publishers do and they want you they want it to be cookie cutter you did it once write it again you do it twice write it again and that's just a Hollywood formula if you think about it, Rocky 1, Rocky 2, Rocky 3, Rocky 4, Star Wars 1, Star Wars 2, Star Wars 3, and it just goes on and on and on. But it's like if you get a good, you know, even James Bond is a perfect example of that. James Bond has been James Bond for, what, uh, 40, 50 years now? Never ages, but, you know, the public just, you know, they like to see James Bond. And, we don't, and you know, we, we suspend our disbelief that, you know, this man hasn't aged. <laughs> you know, we, we suspend that to say, yes, James Bond is still young. Yes, James Bond is, you know, all this. And we go and we support that and, and we love that. So that's part of the storytelling, you know, commercial, commercial style. Uh, what was your question? You had another question. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Um, Yeah, you give up, it, it really depends on the individual and what it is that you're in the business for. Some people are in for it to make money and they don't care about anything as long as they get a, they get a check and you know, they can get paid and, and that sort of thing, they, they, they don't care. But you know, writing is just like any other art, just like being a musician or a singer, you have to practice it and you have to understand the craft of it because writing is a craft and there's so many different forms of it. There's so many, there's, you know, there's theatrical writing, there's screenplays, there's prose, there's fiction, there's nonfiction. There's just so many areas of writing. And then, as far as I'm concerned, writing's, writing is man's greatest, uh, the written word is man's greatest invention. Because without the written word, you would have nothing. Think about it, without words, where would you be? There would be so much we wouldn't know. There would be so much we wouldn't be able to communicate. So, so as far as I'm concerned, the written word is just ex extremely, extremely important. And then, uh, and even with that being said, well, the printing press was invented back in the 1500s, somewhere around there, the mid to late 1500s when the printing press was invented. So prior to the printing press, how did we communicate? There was no word. There was no written way. We had to communicate orally. Yes? I'm thinking and it just reminds me Uh-huh. And how they, the guy put his hand up. Mm -hmm. That was the first word. Yeah, well, yeah, the, 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 the hieroglyphics, the pictures, and, and, those, and those sorts of things where you tell the stories through pictures. And ironically, if you go to any fast food restaurant now, they don't put words on the, on the uh, computers, they put a picture. You look at, you know, you look at computers and things like right now, they put a picture <laughs> because it's easier to read than word. Um, so, but one of the things that the way we communicated and told stories was through body language. We had, to, we had to have body language in order to tell our stories. And so, for example, to show you how powerful body language is, for example, if I say, oh man, I just won the lottery, I am so happy, woo, I have a, do you believe me? Why not? Right, my body language. My body language is not in agreement with what I'm saying. So comedians are masters at this. Preachers are masters at this, of getting people involved by marrying the written word with body language to tell a story. If you ever watch, if you ever go to church and you listen to a good pastor talk, or you go to a good uh, comedy club, it's just one person, a microphone, a stool, and a bottle of water, but they are so good at the craft of storytelling they can make you feel like you are watching a movie right before your eyes and you're just watching one person's body language speak. That's, that's the power of words. That's the power of body language. That's the power of all of, of all of that. So the next time you go see a comedian, you know, think about that. This is just a person, their voice, their words, and body language. But how do they pull you in to make you feel like you're experiencing something unique. That's what they do. Yes? When, when was it that you actually started writing? I mean, what happened? What clicked? 
Oh, very good question. What clicked for me when I actually started writing? You know what? I came to realize that writing was something special because you hear writers say, oh, I have the writer's voice or there's a voice in my head. And I, well, that's true. As long as I don't answer it, I, I know I'm saying. <laughs> but uh, it started when I was a kid. It started when I was a kid. I didn't know what it was, but I was the kid that would go to school and I would sit in the classroom and I would daydream. I would make up stories. My mind was constantly going. I could never stay in the present moment because my mind was always off into some other realm, making up stuff and, and, and doing things. I did not realize that I could actually write and tell a story until I was in junior high school when I was getting girlfriends. <laughs> when I was writing the little love notes in the hallway and you know, or you know, I was looking at a girl and I would describe her hair or describe her clothes and that sort of thing and I'd give her the note and the next thing you know, you know, she's coming up to me, it's like, I really like what you said, can you say it again? I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, really? And so, you know, I was this little nerdy, skinny kid, you know, all bony, wiry, you know, there were guys that were you know, much bigger, you know, much more better looking, but you know, here are the cheerleaders coming up to me and I'm just like, you know, I'm all smiles like, <laughs> <laughs> but it was, it was, it was because, it was because of that gift, I got beat up because of it, like, you know, oh, you think you're Casanova, huh? But, you know, but that, that's, when I, that's when I realized, okay, there's something to this. But once I got to college and I started taking writing classes in college, that's when it really began to flower. That's when I really began to say, oh my God, I can sit here and write for hours. In fact, when I was 19, this is going back to when computers were just a black screen with orange letters. <laughs> I would sit and, you know, the big plastic floppy disk that was five and you put it in a thing, you know. And so I would sit Saturday afternoons. I would sit from sunup to sundown at the computer writing. Freaked my father out. My father's like, boy, what the hell is wrong with you? You're 19 years old, it's a Saturday afternoon or a Saturday night and you're sitting at a computer. He thought I was writing a manifesto to kill them. <laughs> <laughs> because he, he, didn't, he didn't understand. He didn't understand that that was just this creativity, this, this thing that was in me. This, it, had to, it, it had to be told. It had to come out. Uh, and there was no way that I could help it. I mean, finger, I mean uh, writing to me is what my fingers are to my hand. I just cannot help it. It's just something that will, it's just something that's going to come out no matter what. No matter, no matter what. Uh, it's something that uh, if I didn't get paid to do it, I would still do it. It's, it's just that strong. It's just like, you know, why, you know, why does the singer sing? Why does the athlete work out? It's just a part of who they are. It is in their DNA. It is in their DNA. Yes? Okay. Um, another thing uh, I will tell you about uh, when I began to, uh, when I started publishing, uh, I had, uh, when I got out of college, this is about 91, 92, somewhere around there, I thought I was gonna be the next Alex Haley. I thought I was going to write that great American novel, make a whole lot of money, and ride off into the sunset, to, you know, with you know, you know, on my saddle with you know, gold jingling in this you know, satchel. Uh, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Um, I kept writing, and I kept writing to publishers, and I kept writing, and, I was like, and they wrote some of the most beautifully written, no answers I have ever had the pleasure of reading. And they said, "Dear Mr. Sewell." Thank you for your submission, but I'm afraid this is not what we're looking for at this particular time. <laughs> Come on in. This is not what we're looking for at this particular time. So they had some of the most wonderful letters, rejection letters, and I got rejection letter after rejection letter after rejection letter. And I will, I will share this with you, uh, and, this, and this is because this is a, this is a mom story. Um, one of the things that ended up happening after so, after so many rejection letters, I gave up. I gave up. And so... I went, to visit, uh, I went to visit my mother one day. I went to visit my mother. And, I, and, and, and my mother, whenever she knew something was on my mind, your mother just knows you. you. No matter what you do, your mom just knows you. So I'm about 31, 32 years old. And my mother says, come into the bedroom. I want to talk to you. And so she used to do this to me when I was a kid, you know, sit on the edge of the bed, tell mama what's wrong. And so I'm like, mom, I'm 32 years old. I you know, go in the bedroom like I'm a kid. Mother, come on in here. And so I went in the room, mama closed the door, you know. She said, sit down there at your spot. I'm like, Phew. she's like, now what's wrong? I said, nothing's wrong. She says, why aren't you doing what you want to do? I was like, mom, what are you talking about? I got a nice job, I'm taking care of myself. 
you know, I don't have kids from pillar to post. What more, do you, what more could a mom ask for? She goes, you're not happy. And I said, I said, you know, and then, you know, that, that was ego when she went, then my ego started to talk because my ego didn't want to let my mother know that she was right. I was like, mom, I'm happy, trust me. She goes, no, you're not. I said, mom, I'm happy. And she's like, no, you're not. She says, you need to go back and start writing and do what it is that you want to do. And I was like, whatever. And so ironically, you know, I left and, you know, I didn't think much more of it. A couple of days later, I get a call from my aunt says, your mom's sick in the hospital. I was like, whoa, I just talked to her a couple of days ago. Went to see my mom in the hospital. A few days later, she passed away. And so I was like, okay, now my mom, being the mom that she is, mom can be really weird. So of course, when, you, when someone you love that's that close to you passes away, you not only feel that deep sense of loss, but you also start looking around and say, are they in here with me? In some way, shape, or form. So I go to sleep. And in the, I have a dream about my mother, and in, in the dream, my mother says, I would like to give you a hug. And I was like, and, she, and I was like, yeah, you can give me a hug. She goes, no, I need your permission to give, you a, to give you a hug. I was like, mom, you can give me a hug. There's no big deal with this. And she says, this is going to feel weird. And so my mom gave me a hug, and it was, I felt like a bolt of electricity went through me. And I actually got up, and I, I leaped up out of the bed, and I woke up, and I could smell her scent everywhere. It was just like all over the room. I was like, whoa, what is that? Whoa, 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 whoa. And I was like, you know, you just don't, just, whoa. So I went into the bathroom and I turned on the light and I looked at stuff in the mirror. And I was like, what in the world was all of that? And then something, then I got still and I got quiet. And something said, right. And that's when I wrote my first book. It was called Taken for Granted. Instead of going to a publisher, I self-published it. I self-published it, and it was my passion, and I sold it and sold it and sold it, and eventually a publisher got hold of it, and they offered me the book deal. But what my mother did in the spiritual realm was she said, gave me a kick in the butt, and said, that's what that was. That was the kick in the butt. And so I was writing from a very, very deep place when I wrote that book, a very deep place. And so as I got into the commercial world, I sort of lost that. I lost that a little bit. And so now going back and doing what I'm doing now, it's getting back to, to the core of what I do and the core of what I enjoy. I said, this is truly a part of my DNA. This is truly a part of who I am because not everybody can just sit at a computer and form thoughts and get them to go the way that they want them to go. Not everybody can develop characters and create characters because what comes easy for me, other people struggle at. It's like I couldn't, hold a, I couldn't hold a tune if you put it in my hand, but some people are naturally gifted and they can sing. But for me, you know, I, you, know you thought Ella Fitzgerald could break a glass, you know, I could shatter it. <laughs> I could shatter and do things like that. Any questions? Anybody got another question? Yes. Histori yeah, I'm working on it now. Uh -huh. Oh, no, 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 not, not, not at all. Um, it, is, it is because the family, they've, they've, part of it is they've heard these stories over and over, but no one has thought to to capture them the way, that, the way that I'm capturing them. And then I'm not just writing the story like, okay, here's what happened. I'm doing the research as into socially what was happening at the time and where these people were in their lives at the time. Because I've never been a sharecropper. I've never been a sharecropper. So, you know, just to read literature on sharecropping and then to talk to my aunt who remembers, I said, okay, what was your day like? And, you know, she would, and so it's, it's like I have to like even talk to her and ask her the right questions to get deeper into just, oh, it was like this. No, I need you to go deeper. And so I was like, so, so one of the things I asked, I was like, well, historically, history tells me that African Americans, one of the things they did is they sewed blankets a lot and they made a lot of patterns and they told stories in the blankets. And I said, did you or grandma ever sew? Oh, we sewed all the time. And I was like, well, what happened to the blankets? 
Oh, she goes, I don't know what happened to him, but you know, yeah, mama could make patterns and this and that. And, she, and then she goes, mama could go to the store and she could see a dress in the window. She can get some fabric and come back and make you the same dress, just like that. I said, so she had a, she had a, you know, a creative eye like that. She goes, oh yeah. And so then I started getting into really, you know, what it was that, you know, you know, how they survived and how they moved forward and the artistry that, you know, they were doing at that time. And, and also listening to like, okay, well, what was your, you know, your, your, your uh, my grandfather like? And she says, oh, daddy knew how to make moonshine. Daddy knew how to make beer. She goes, we all drank moonshine. I was like, what do you mean you drank moonshine? She goes, oh, you couldn't drink the water. I was like, what do you mean you couldn't drink the water? She goes, well, you had to pump water in the ground and it would come up brown and it tasted horrible. So what we did was daddy would make moonshine and keep moonshine in on jars on the shelf and the moonshine tasted better, so we all drank moonshine. And I said, which led to a generation of alcoholics. <laughs> so, but you know, that was stuff that I, I, could have, I, I would have never known that you know, she, she gave me. It was, thing, it was things like that. It's like, well, where did he learn how to do that? And so she gave me like, well, he learned from his father. So it was this tradition that was passed down, which I just found to be you know, fascinating. Again, because I did not know these individuals. Whereas, you know, she could, give, she could give me that kind of sensibility and that kind of history, which was really exciting. You had a question, too. Uh, I have another question. A question I asked now is, did you ever go to the Delta to get that sense of history? And sense of place? Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And I had gone there several times as a, as a kid and as a teenager, so I was familiar with the area. But, you know, when I was, you know, 17, I was like... Ain't nothing down here but some red clay mud, cause it's from Mississippi. Some red, you know, it was just like nothing, a whole lot of nothing for miles around. And it didn't register to me of like place and where I was or anything like that. It was just, this is boring. I'm 17 years old, I need a party, I need some music. You know, but you, you know, now going back and looking at it as an adult, it's a different feel. It's, it's, a, different, it's a different sense. There's a whole, it's, it's when you're in place, it, and you understand place where you are, you get a whole new appreciation for it. You get a whole new, and you try to, you know, I try to bring that to the writing now because writing is about, you know, place and audience and who it is that you're speaking to. And then to, to get the reader, when you write historical fiction, the, thing, the trick is to get the reader to believe that when they read historical fiction, they're reading as if it is now, as, it is, as if the stories that's, happening is the present moment and so that's the that's the that's the trick to that's the trick to that and so it's it's been real it's been it's been real interesting yes yes very good question very good question the dialect is i've been actually studying that because there's varying forms of it i mean there's there's the there's a the very deep dialect where you can like was w-u-z and, and those sorts of things where, you know, depending on where you are in history, you know, that's the kind of thing that you're going to get. I also took the time to YouTube, uh, Ted Koppel back in the late 80s, early 90s did a um, news report uh, when they had the, the Library of Congress released all of these recordings of former slaves. And you can listen to the voice and you can actually hear them. You can YouTube it. And you can, you can hear the voices that were recorded before they started to die off. And this was done in the 1930s. And you can listen to this one guy, his name was Fountain Hughes. But the way he spoke, he says, my name is Fountain Hughes. I was slave, they sold us like hogs, chickens, anything, you didn't mean nothing. And so you listen to that and you, you, you realize that when he's talking, he isn't talking English, but you understand him perfectly. You understand him perfectly. And so that, that's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the uniqueness of that. And you can follow that to any other dialect of any other culture. You know, they're going to speak in a particular dialect. And you may, and you know, and depending on um, where you're from, you'll understand them perfectly, although they're not speaking perfectly. So yes, some of it will be written in uh, dialect, but as social change starts to happen and education starts to become more prevalent, you will see the switch the switch will start happening. So again, that gets back down into the craft of a novel, how you craft your words and, and you know, the word placement and all of that. That's where all of that becomes very, very important. And then it has to have a rhythm to it. You can't, you can't load it down so heavily that it becomes unreadable. 
So, you know, there, there's a whole style to that because your narrative voice has to be perfect English, but then you can let the dialogue set up. So the narrative voice has to set it up so that you understand what, what is being said. Um, yes? It's going to be three books. It's going, to be, it's going to be three books. It's going to go from 1918, 1964, 1964 to 1984, 1984 to 2004. It's going to be in three distinct sections. And so you follow, it's like a family saga where you follow this family, you follow this generations of family through this, through this time. Uh, they have significance. They have significance. 1918 was the flu pandemic. It was something that I could research and look up and find uh, information on. 19, uh, 1964 was the year my grandmother died. Okay, uh, 1984 was the year my brother died. And so, it, you know, those are significant, you know, they're, they're, they're pivotal points because we all have points in our lives where events happen that shift us, that change us, that changes our perspective, that, you know, that changes the way we make a decision. We all have those points in our lives that do that. Yeah. Uh, yes? Yeah, very good. Uh, you know what, one of the things that I was asked to do, um, this was back in about 2005, was to see if I, they, uh, a, my publisher Harlequin wanted to say, hey, can you write Young Adult? because what was happening was that there was a void in contemporary young adult fiction specifically for African-American kids. And so Harlequin wanted to be a groundbreaker and try to change that. And so Harlequin asked if I would be able to do that. Could I, do, could I write as a teenager? And so that was a growing point for me because that was a big shift for me. So I had to somewhere go and find my inner 16-year-old girl, <laughs> my inner 16-year-old girl, and create a story. And so, um, so I did. And nobody knew what was going to happen with this. No one, no one had any clue. And so I created a story called Keisha's Drama, and it just went poof, viral. It went all over the place. Kids were reading it. They couldn't get enough of it. They liked the character. They didn't believe I was a man. <laughs> and so Harlequin loved that so much, they said, write another. And I was like, okay. And then they said, oh, it's doing great. Write another. And I was like, okay, I'm tired of this little girl. <laughs> and so, you know, because, you know, the first book comes from, you know, a deeper place, and then you, you, there's only so far you can take the character. You see this with J.K. Rollins with Harry Potter. She says, I have to get rid of Harry Potter. I'm tired of Harry Potter. And so what was one book turned out to be eight books. I mean, I, don't, I didn't know how much more I could do with this child. But it, 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 it became, it's so popular you know, for young, adult, young adults because it gets them to read where, uh, what they call them reluctant readers. It gets kids that would not normally read reading. And so that, that's like, you know, in, in library terms, that's like a phenomenon. They're just like excited about that because kids are reading. So if there was something that I would like to see turned into film or stage play or something like that, it would be that. It, 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 would, be, it would be that. And I cannot tell you as I've traveled around to high schools and other places, how much kids come up to me and they're like, I read your book and it's the first book I've ever read. I've gone around to juvenile detention centers and I've spoken at juvenile detention centers where kids are detained and they have no other choice but to read. And so, and then be a vehicle for inspiration for that. And so that has, so even experiencing that has changed me personally because, I, because writing all of a sudden, you know, I put something out and it gave me something completely different back. And what it gave me back transformed me. And so, you know, I'm, I'm like, wow, you know, I just, I, it, my, one of my biggest uh, events was I, uh, the uh, school district uh, made it required reading and they had me as a guest author. And I came to there and the bleachers were filled with about 1,500 kids. All of them had read the book. All of them were excited. And you get so much, you get, you get energy, that, that was energy. That was, that was just energy. I mean, just, and, and to be able to hold the attention 
of kids from 14 to 18 and to and to actually have them like you know they they are into it they are with you they are present i mean and and they and they are with you i mean you just feel that energy and i was just talking but when i got done i was exhausted and so i understand what singers say and performers say when they when they feel a crowd roar or they feel the noise i mean that is something so special something so unique that it's just like, whoa. You, I mean, you walk away going, whew. You know, it's like, you know, afterwards I had to go home, say a prayer, say, okay, God, thank you for giving me the strength for that one. But that was, that was intense. That, that was very intense. Keisha's drama. Keisha's drama. And so, you know what? If, you, if, you'll, indulge, if, you'll, if you'll indulge me for a second, um, I'll, I'll read a little bit from that. But when I, when, and this is what I do with the, with the kids when I read. And this will this will be fun. This will be short. Um, one of the things that I do is earlier I was talking about comedians and how they give stories and things like that. Um, one of the things that I decided to study and try to do was because I knew I was reading for young adult audiences um, to be more than just a talking head to give them you know something more exciting, and so. I came up with this little thing that I called a dramatization. And so there's something specific in African-American culture called the call and response. Everybody know what I say when I say call and response? Okay, for call and response, it, uh, it means like, uh, if I say something, like everybody heard of all the single ladies by Beyonce, right? Beyonce? All the, yeah. <laughs> okay, so Beyonce will go, all the single ladies, and you hear back what? All right, one more time. All the single ladies. Yeah, see, y'all acting like y'all ain't saying, all the single ladies. Okay, all right, are you waking, I'm waking you up. Okay, I give out the call and you respond back to me. So what I do with the students is I say, we're going to do a dramatization. I'm going to do a dramatization. You're going to watch me transform into a 16-year-old girl. I know that's going to be hard to believe, but you're going to watch that. I said, this is going to be a dramatization. So my call is going to be, this is up, and I want you to say back, dramatizations. Try it again. This is up. Well, let's get that right now. <laughs> this is a... No, no, you say dramatization. Okay, okay, you guys say dramatization, all right. See, the kids get it right away. <laughs> okay, this is a... This is a... All right, you got it. So what I'm going to do here is this is Keisha's drama. This is a 16-year-old girl whose grandmother's in jail. Her mother's on her way to jail. Uh, she's about to be put out and evicted. And so she's coming home because she went out shopping with her girlfriend and they went out for a five finger discount. Anybody know what I mean when I say five finger discount? They went out stealing. <laughs> and so, so the girlfriend got caught stealing. The girlfriend got caught stealing and Keisha's coming home and seeing the girlfriend for the first time after she's gotten out of jail. Okay, so you're gonna watch this, ready? Gotta put on my glasses. <clears throat> now remember, at certain points, I'm going to go, this is up. All right, keep up. Ready? <sighs> I didn't go directly home after school because I was afraid to. I spent an hour hanging around the basketball court watching shirtless boys shoot baskets. It was cool for a while. But then this gang of girls who were there started making fun of me because of my bad skin and damaged hair, so I left. As I walked home, I began to think. If my mother didn't come home to pay the rent, I knew I'd have to leave, but I didn't know where I'd go. As I was approaching my building, I saw Toya sitting on a stoop with Junior's father. I was so happy to see her, I rushed up the street calling out her name. Toya! I shouted out. And Toya gave me a nasty look that made me drop the smile off my face. This is up! What's going on, wench? Excuse you? I snapped at her. Give me a minute to deal with her. She said to her boyfriend. He glanced at me with judgmental eyes before stepping away to sit in a car which was parked in a vacant lot near the building. Why did you leave me hanging like that? Toya asked. Her voice was edgy and full of confrontation. Toya, I got scared. I didn't know what to do. The police were arresting you. You were yelling and hollering. What was I supposed to do? You were supposed to have my back. Toya pushed my shoulder and I backed up. 
She wanted to fight me, and I could see it in her eyes. This is up! <laughs> Toya, look! We just got a big misunderstanding here. I said, trying to calm her down. Other people who were hanging around on the block started paying attention to our conflict. If we kept up our loud argument, it wouldn't be long before a crowd would form and encourage us to knuckle up our fists and beat each other senseless for their entertainment. This is up! <laughs> nah, there's no misunderstanding. All I know is I should kick your ass for what you did. Because of you, the Department of Family Services took Junior away from me. They took Junior away from you? I was surprised by that. Yeah, and it's all your entire fault. She said, absolutely convinced of her reasoning. This is up! How is that my fault? I told you not to bring that boy in the first place. I called you, Keisha. Because I wanted you to come and get him from me. I didn't care about going to jail because I knew I'd get out. But I didn't want to take Junior with me. Instead of helping me, you ran your little scared butt out the door. This is up. You know what? I stopped backing away from her and I stood my ground. That is not my fault. I told you that if something went down and we need to get away, Junior would be a problem. You should have thought about the consequences before taking him along with us. Plus, why are you always blaming things on other people when things don't go right for you? This is up. That's not the way I see it. Toya pushed me and I backed up and I pushed her back. Everything that went wrong is your fault. We would have gotten out of that quicker had you not been lollygagging 30 minutes with that sales girl. Fight! I heard someone on the street yell out. Before I knew it, there were people gathering to watch the outcome of our conflict. Toya! Let's not do this. Everybody say, Toya! Toya! Let's not do this. One more time. Toya! Toya. Let's not do this. I pleaded with her. We've been friends for far too long. <laughs> oh, girl. <laughs> I'm about to open up a can of whoop ass on you. Toya reached into her back pocket and she pulled out a straight razor she'd shown me a few days earlier. I quickly backed up because I didn't want to end up with a facial scar like my mother's friend Simon. This is up. She opened it up. And she swung at me, but I was too far away from her. Toya, it wasn't my fault. I shouted at her, hoping to get her to see my point of view. Why are you always starting fights? I asked, but I didn't get a response. I quickly scanned the ground in search of a weapon, but I did not find one. This is up. <laughs> Come on, Keisha. <laughs> you can't run, girl. It's about to go down. She taught at me, and I was a nervous wreck. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't run because there was a crowd of people surrounding us and I certainly didn't want to step forward and get wrists split open by a razor. Toya, please. I pleaded with her. She swung at me again. This time she aimed for my face. Somebody help me, I shouted out. And someone from the crowd answered back. Help yourself. Say help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. Help yourself. How was that? Toya, how was I supposed to know they were going to take Junior away from you, huh? I asked. I figured if I kept talking to her, I might get through to her. I mean, really, why would I want to see them take your baby away from you? Because you wanted to have a baby with Ronnie and you couldn't get pregnant. She said to me, that's not true and you know it. I shouted back to her, hoping that she would see my point of view again. This time she swung at me again and she almost got me on the neck. The circle of people surrounding us was getting tighter and tighter and I had absolutely nowhere to go. And that's where I stop. That's where I stop. That is Keisha's drama. <laughs> that is Keisha's drama. <laughs> So when I do, when I, yes? Do you do audible books? Yes, I've done them before, yes, yes. Um, so when I, when I, again, when I talk about storytelling, you know, you know, even with that, just finding that creative voice, finding the way to blend the stage presence, the, the comedy, the body language with the words, to get all of that to come together and to give the reading power and passion 
and, and to, to, again, to give the audience, to put the audience right there with you. That's the trick of it. That's the beauty of it. That's the fun of what I do. Any other questions? Yes? I know there's one of your books, you um, have another author on there. How do you write with someone else? Do you do it together as, as yeah, people? Yeah, good question. That's a social affair. I wrote that with an author called Pat Tucker, uh, named Pat Tucker. And what happened was, um, the publisher, I owed the publisher a book. And I was like, well, I'm too busy. <laughs> and they said, well, we need another book from you, so we'll pair you up with this other author, and you know, you guys can write a book together. Now, that's very hard because it's two different voices. And so the author that I wrote with, she's a fast writer, and so authors have processes. Some authors have one process, and another author has another process. Well, Pat's process is to write lickety split. And so, you know, she says, well, I'll start the story off. We had a general outline of where we wanted to go. So she started the story off, and I started, and so she wrote it, and I said, okay, I can respond to this, because she wrote a female character, and I wrote a male character. And they, and they were going to have a relationship online. So she wrote something, and then I wrote a chapter back like a day or two later, and I'm thinking, okay, it's gonna take her a day or two to get back to me. 20 minutes later, she says, here's another chapter. And so, and I was like, 20, I literally 20 minutes later, she's like, here's the next chapter. And I'm like, whoa, wait, did you think about this? <laughs> and so, you know, because I want to analyze, you know, and think about stuff, you know, she's like, oh no, there's the next chapter. You know, she goes, she goes, you know, send the next chapter. And so I read and I said, okay, you know, I'm not going to, you know, you know, because ego's talking now because now I don't want to be a punk. You know, so I was like, you know, I was like, get away, here's a chapter for you. You know, like, she goes, here you go again. So it was like Venus and Serena. Ping, <laughs> ping, ping, ping. <laughs> you know, and it just kept going. And so what ended up happening, we ended up, right, it became this kind of weird kind of ego type of story because the story was all centered around telling lies online. So it got to the point where I would tell a lie with the characters and then she would tell a lie. Then I would tell another lie. And then she would, then the lies just got so big. And I was, and I was sitting there saying, okay, I don't see how women could even think about this lie right here. I mean, I learned so much. I'm like, wow. Um, so it was, you, I had to, we had to find a way to meet each other where we were. And so, you know, writing with her, I had to understand that about her and what she do. I didn't worry about her voice or her style or anything like that. I kept it, she, I let her write what she wanted to write. However, there were points where her characters, I had to write her characters in my chapters. So she wrote in dialect, so she, was, she would write like, girl, and spell like G-U-R-R-R-R-R. <laughs> and, so, and so whenever her character came into my chapter, I had to be true to that voice. And I had to write, you know, girl, and do that. And so when my characters, when she had to write my characters, I had to go back and correct her, say, this is not true to this character, this character isn't talking this way, you're having the character talk like your character's talking. So we did have to have, you know, those, you know, those types of adjustments. Um, but other than that, you know, it was the fastest I've ever written a book. And, and when, I, when we got done, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I was like, I said, okay, I don't know if readers are gonna really like dig this, or they're gonna be like, oh my God, they should have taken more time. The, from a commercial standpoint, the book sold out in two weeks. From the publisher standpoint, they were like, do another one. And I'm like, oh, here we go again. You know, you know, and so, and, and so, which they literally said, you know, once the book sold out, they said, do another one. And so we had to come up with an, you know, outline and all this other stuff. But, um, you know, if people read the reviews and, you know, they're talking about just lying people online because, <laughs> because it's about people who make up fake uh, person fake profiles on Facebook. You know, say you're a doctor when you're a car, used car salesman. <laughs> you, know, you know, say you're, you're something else when you're something else. You know, and that's what, it's, that, that's what the whole story was about. So you're not really sure who you're meeting behind the computer. Why does the publisher have so much power to tell you what to do? Because the, the, they, they have that because they're making money. They're going off of what is selling. And they're in it, they're not in it for craft per se, they're in it to turn a profit. And so that's, that's what they're doing. They're looking to turn a profit. So they give you so much money and then tell you, I'm the one you write, that's how, how 
Yeah, it, it, you know, we, we can give a, a general outline. For example, you don't send a book about hunting to a Simon & Schuster publisher, you know, that deals with, you know, thrillers and things like that. They're not interested in a story about a hunter. You have to find a publisher that's interested in hunting books that's going to market to that particular audience. So when the publisher says we want a book about, or you know, our history are our books about blah, 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 you need to come up with an outline similar to what we've already published that we know we can sell that will be successful. That's where they come in with the power. So again, when you want to write from the creative soul and create something completely different, you, you, yeah, it's possible to find a publisher to do that, but you know, that just may be your personal work. Yeah. Yes. Uh, with, like with the Keisha's drama, um, in about 2005, in about 2005. And what, what, I, what I try to do with, with the book is I, I show the dynamics of social class in that story. Because what ends up happening is, you know, Keisha eventually gets out of her situation and she meets, a, she has a different experience and a different kind of life. And so she has to learn that now that she's moved past certain social problems, who is she? Who am I? Because I'm so used to conflict all the time. I'm so used to certain types of behavior. And now that all of those things have been removed, I'm confused. And so it's about the growing process of her. I wanted to take Keisha all the way through college and you know, you know, show just like how she grew up. But the publisher said, no, she has to stay 16 forever. I said, why? He says, because she's marketable. It's a brand now, kind of like the It Girls, the Gossip Girls and all that. It's a brand now. So that, you know, the fourth graders, by the time they're 16, she'll still be around. And so I'm like, Ugh. they said, you can take a break. We can come back to her, think about it, and then you'll do another story about her. And I'm like, Whew. so, you know, now you've got a new problem there. Now you have a character that you can't age like James Bond that always has to have some kind of conflict going. And so... That's what it does to you mentally and, you know, as a, as a creative mind, like, what do you do with that? You know, you got to find it somewhere. Yes? When do you write early morning, late at night, and uh, what do you do to stay creative? What do you do to stay creative? Read. Reading is a byproduct. Writing is a byproduct of reading. Read. Read, 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 read. Uh, and, when I, and whenever I write, there is no, um, well, I'll take that back. I, if I can just find, I have like noise cancellation headphones. If I find a quiet time, half hour, I can sit anywhere and write. You know, I just tune the world out. And usually Saturdays and Sundays are intense writing days for me. I can write up from sun up to sundown. Yes. Good question. Good question. Um, I have run into that in my own writing because since I write in multiple genres, since I write adult and young adult, my 16-year-old started sounding a little too adult. So I had to like go back and correct that because I was like, oh, no, 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 this is a character from another book talk. And I was like, get out of there. It's not your turn yet. So I, I do have to be very aware of that. And what I do to help myself with that was when I'm writing a teen book, I've submerged myself in teen-like things. I have to go and watch all the videos, go and watch MTV, gotta go, you know, and I just, you know, and so I have to like let go of the adults in me that just says, this is just some of the stupidest. <laughs> but I have, to, I have to say, okay, I have to be young and look at it from, you know, a, a young person's perspective. And so, you know, and, and, you know, I just, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and I, we were talking about, you know, when I was growing up, I said, you know what? I used to love my parachute pants the plastic pants, you know, I used to love with all the zippers and all this other stuff. I said, I used to love those pants. And they're just like, let it go. <laughs> let it go. Yes, sir. When, when you read others, do you find yourself emulating others and taking a book and reading more of the story and sitting back and, and you read something and you love it and you go, why did I like that so much? Very good question. Yeah, very, very good question. Uh, yes, because they're, 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 sometimes I'll read someone's uh, work and I say, why didn't I think of that? I mean, that was uh, just, you know, a, a story that just blows me away. There are, there are certain things where there are authors have 
really good word marriages uh, when, when they give imagery. You know, what do they call it? A prepositional phrase. You know, they have really good prepositional phrases and I'm like, oh, I like that, I like that. Cut, paste, save for later. You know, I, I, do, I do take that and pluck it out and say, okay, let me, how can I rearrange this? Or this, this is really what my character is thinking or doing. So I'll take a prepositional phrase and I'll do that. But yeah, there's some books that I do that where I just, I just love it. And I was like, oh, this is really good. Because you know, you, you, when you read a book, you'll read a, you'll read a passage and you're like, ah, and, you, and, you, and you'll find yourself highlighting it in the book or flagging it in the book. And you'll say, that's it right there. That's, that's, that's it right there. That's the thought. That's, the, that's my aha moment. That's my moment of change or something like that. And so, I, you, know, I, you know, sometimes, you know, people come up with, a, with my books and they'll say, you know, they'll have it all flagged and they say, what did you mean when you wrote this right here? And I'm like, I have no clue I wrote that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, I do that. Any other questions? <laughs> How do I stay 16? Yeah, I mean, that, that's the only way is just to submerge myself in the life. Sometimes I'll go to the mall and I'll watch kids. Sometimes I'll go up to the local high school, find out when their basketball tournament or football tournament is, and just go and just sit just so I could be around them without looking like a pervert. <laughs> um, yeah, and j just so that I can hear what the latest slang is and you know, what they're saying and, and, and those sorts of things. And then also teenagers with the social media world, they put all of their life all of it out there. So my teen followers, I can go to their page and they'll have their latest video clip up of what they've done, where they've been, and they just put it out there. You know, they got their own personal blogs. I mean, you go to YouTube and you know, type in teen blog, oh my God. They, they will, they'll be in their bedroom saying, okay, this is my personal blog. My name is Stacy, and I'm over here, and like, you know, this is my best friend, hi. And you know, <laughs> you know and they'll, they'll just do that, and we're gonna do something really stupid. We're going to twerk. And they'll put on a move and they'll start twerking. I'm like, what is a twerk? <laughs> and you know, they, they go in there and do this dance, and I'm just like, really? It, it, but you know, and so, but you know, you look at who's following, and they got hits. They like you know, eight thousand views in you know two days, and I'm like, wow. So you know, that that's that's how I do it. You know, it's it's like, you know, it's like wow. Yes. Have you ever started writing a book and the character said take me somewhere else? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I have I've I've had characters that have uh, that have done that. That I they took me places that I did not expect. And that's what ends up happening when you write something and then someone says, oh, I love this character and they try to come back to, or they try to tell you what were you thinking with this or how did you come with this character? And I'm like, mm hmm they were just in there. They just, you know, that's the beauty of it. When, when, when you, that's when, the, that's when the real channeling happens when you write, where you're just in that moment and you're writing and the room disappears and you're, it's just you in that creative mind and it is just going. Yes. I see everything, um, that's a good question. When I write, I see everything as a movie. I see it, I see it all going as it's, as it's moving. I see, you know, I see place, I see clothes, I see, I see it all. But that's because I believe that when I am not writing, I'm always aware of writing. It's like this guy here, he's already in a book just because of the way you're sitting, your glasses and your shirt and your bald head. <laughs> So, you know, it's like, it's like I've already, you know, I've already got that. So it's like I'm always aware of writing. I'm always aware. And so stuff, it's, it's amazing what the brain does. If you think about the brain, think about how many thoughts it processes in a day or an hour or a minute. Your brain is constantly processing, constantly, and it's repetitive and it takes in stuff. And it's like, why am I even thinking about this? You know, and you know, you ever think about what you're thinking about? You know, that, that's kind of a weird thing. You ever think about what you're thinking about? And then you're like, well, well you, know, you look at all you think, what am I thinking about? <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, so, so the brain is always processing. It, it just never shuts off. And anybody ever have their creative brain get away from them and take you on a place and then have you all upset about something that hasn't even happened yet? <laughs> and, it, and it just goes and goes and goes. And you say, well, if this happened, then this might happen. And if that happened, oh God, if that happened, then I'd have to do it. And you go all and your brain just takes you all off on a tangent. And you have to like, why was I, you know, when you think about it, 
why did I get myself all worked up? You know, and, and, you know, but that's what the brain does. It's constantly on. It's constantly on. And the last thing I'll, I'll mention this is with the brain. I like, to, I like to tell people this to freak them out. Is with the brain. It's like you, you are not, as, as humans, we are not our thoughts. We are not our thoughts. We are not our past. We are not our thoughts. Our thoughts are just things we are processing. What we are is we are the awareness of our thought. For example, have you ever done something and you said, oh, Earl, you shouldn't have done that, or oh, something, or you shouldn't have done that. Have you ever had that conversation with yourself where you said you shouldn't have done that? Okay, when you say that, then that implies two people because you're talking about you as if you are something or someone else. So who is the I? The I is the consciousness that is who you are. If you don't believe me, you are all here present and conscious right now. You are functioning, you're in your body. When you go to bed at night and you go to sleep and you don't dream, where do you go? Your consciousness goes someplace else. Your brain may still be functioning and giving you dreams, but that consciousness is gone. When you wake up, it comes back. And there's that brief moment before you wake up where you don't hear sound, all of a sudden you may hear someone in the bathroom, you may suddenly smell something, but a few seconds before that, you didn't smell a damn thing. You didn't hear a damn thing. So where did you go? So that's who you are. You are that awareness. You are that consciousness. And that's my presentation. All right? <laughs>